speak to our Friday panel, shall we? Uh, get into that and some of the big stories kicking about this weekend. Let, uh, Lettis uh, Bromovsky joins us, political commentator and journalist uh, Bill Bowkett as well. Uh, Lettis, Bill, hello, good evening to you both. Hi, very good evening. Um, I appreciate it. Lettis, let's start with you on this issue about Dominic Raab then, shall we? Front page of the Mail today, broadly uh, a, a, a Tory supporting paper, although they've been sticking the knife in a little bit lately, and uh, they've gone real heavy on him. That will put pressure on Boris Johnson. He's stuck with him, should he? Well, I mean, with this whole sort of story, personally, I find it a bit of a non-issue. Yes, it's definitely a sort of PR nightmare for the government going on right now. But it's also a humanitarian this anger... nightmare, isn't it, Lettuce, for those people who perhaps well, yeah, weren't no. taken out of Afghanistan quick enough because the foreign secretary didn't make a phone call? Of course, of course. But all this anger that's directed at Dominic Raab, I think, is misplaced. You know, even if he had made that phone call, I think ultimately it would have made little or no difference to the eventual outcome. When this call was being placed, the Taliban were already outside of the city. You know, they were already there. Um, and even more disappointingly, I think this sort of media frenzy surrounding it is distracting from the actual issues at hand. Like you said, this humanitarian crisis, that should be the number one priority. Getting out those Afghans who helped us and saved us when we were there, you know, saving them now, saying that we're there to support them. You're right, Lettis, it, it should be the number one priority. And I suppose that's why there's a question mark over Dominic Raab, right? Because it, it clearly, for whatever reason, didn't seem to be his number one priority. Or at least we have evidence here that for a while on a sunbed in Crete, it wasn't his number one priority. I know, but whether, you know, I highly doubt that Dominic Raab went out there and was completely disconnected from his work, from his phone. Um, you know, that would be that would be terrible. But I doubt that that was the issue. Um, and, you know, newspapers saying what five star hotel he was staying in instead of, you know, the actual global issues that need our attention. This is completely just it's warping what we should be focusing on. OK, Bill, uh, Letty says that this has been blown out of proportion, that it's a it's a non issue. It's a non story. We shouldn't be concerned about it. I mean, to an extent. Um, it might be the case. I mean, one of the interesting things to note is that in the Times today, uh, there were reports that not only were the permanent secretaries of the Foreign Office, you know, Philip Barton, uh, Matthew Rycroft, uh, they they were um, all on leave as well, mm. um, and, and the Ministry of Defence as well. Uh, and many of them have to work abroad anyway when they're on their summer summer vacations because of the the requirement of being working for the foreign office especially having to work through different time zones so i can to an extent empathize with uh, dominic raab having you know the job that he's had over the the last year uh, having at times to step in for boris johnson when he was terminally ill uh, with coronavirus uh, but, and also having to deal with other geopolitical issues uh, particularly regarding uh, china uh, and now with the situation happening uh, in Afghanistan. I feel a massive butt coming here, Bill. <laughs> You're building up to a massive <laughs> butt here. Um, but at the same time, it, it was a crucial <laughs> it phone is. call, and he, and he should have been there. Uh, and, and there does seem to be a level of redemption or, or, or an effort by uh, Rob to, to try and... Uh, the mistakes that he made... Uh, you know, in, in this revelation that came out in the Daily Mail, uh, chairing the NATO uh, meeting today uh, and saying that he's fully committed to the role uh, and that he's been prioritising the security uh, at the situation going on in Kabul. Sure. OK, Lettuce, there are there are literal calls for his resignation. I mean, this is not this is not uh, uh, come from nowhere. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, as is always the case in these situations, there will be a political motivation to it. Uh, no doubt about it. Um, does it does it put pressure on Boris Johnson? Because, I mean, we, we've had endless conversations. I've talked at length, Lettuce, in the last uh, 18 months, two years or so of Boris Johnson's uh, time as prime minister, that he has seemed incapable of getting rid of ministers. We've got a long list of ministers um, who've hung on to jobs when perhaps in previous years they would their misdemeanors would have been enough to see them uh, shoved to the side. Is this another example of Boris Johnson simply being too weak to discipline a foreign secretary who didn't make a crucial call, uh, phone call at a time of crisis? I mean, it definitely is saying a lot about his premiership and it will go on to, you know, reflections on this will continue. Um, but I think that I want to reiterate the point that I don't think it's a non-issue entirely. 
I think it's a non-issue for this moment. Um, and I think that right now it's much more vital that we progress in the ongoing urgent imminent threats in Afghanistan. And I think that that's what Boris Johnson is standing by at the moment. Okay. That there are other more important things that need the priority. And, and I guess I guess one one thing that we probably will uh, all agree on, Bill, is that it feels like uh, a pretty ropey time to be introducing a new foreign secretary. I mean, I sure as hell I, I, I don't think I would be in a, in a position to, to get it, Bill. But I, I, I sure as hell wouldn't want that phone call at this moment in time, telling me to take on the brief for foreign secretary to get across what's going on, to figure out the latest, to to, to brief myself on the ins and outs, and start making really difficult decisions. No, absolutely. And you need to remember that when a minister does resign or, or is sat from office, there is that transitional period of uh, having to then fit into the role, having to meet civil servants and also come up with an, an agenda going forward. And especially in a time uh, when in Afghanistan, the, the situation is constantly ongoing. And it wouldn't be particularly helpful given the fact that uh, Rob has literally just held a G7 meeting with uh, the foreign secretaries of foreign ministers uh, of, of, of various different governments. Mm. Um, and I think that's one thing to note also is that while there are potential candidates that could step into that role, I mean, I mean, one obvious example, that being Tom Tugendhat, who, you know, got I mean, standing, Tobias Elwood you know, could, uh, could exactly could gig, right? a raising ovation, and you know, with his expertise mm. uh, in the Middle East uh, as well as having sat uh, as chair of the uh, Foreign Select Committee. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's too soon. And, and Boris Johnson has said that he has full confidence in his foreign secretary, and he has, you know, throughout his term as prime minister, as I previously mentioned, stepping in when um, when Boris Johnson was ill sure. and being on side in various different other. Yeah foreign policy issues. sure it probably tells you quite a lot though doesn't it bill uh, that the, there are several people we could probably name three or four of them off the uh, top of our head who who could step into that brief tomorrow and be better briefed and be better prepared and better able perhaps to take on the role of foreign secretary at this crucial moment listen bill stay there let us hang on as well our friday panel are with us we'll move away from afghanistan uh, for a minute after two double two our friday panel join us let us Bromovsky, political commentator and journalist Bill Bowkey as well. Let's talk about one of those big stories that's kind of gone a bit under the radar, actually, to be honest with you. Very significant moment, or relatively significant moment, let's perhaps not overstate it, uh, in Scotland. Uh, the SNP have signed uh, a power-sharing agreement with the Green Party. They've unveiled uh, a historic moment. This is a big moment for the Green Party, their first uh, step into government uh, at any period of their history throughout the United Kingdom, uh, and also a commitment within that agreement to an independence referendum within the next couple of years. Um, Bill, let's start with you on this one. H how significant is this? I mean, I'm looking at this thinking oh, we should really be talking about this. Uh, were it not for Afghanistan, we probably would as our top story tonight because does it not all but guarantee a second independence referendum? It doesn't necessarily guarantee a referendum, but what it is is heeding even greater pressure on Boris Johnson uh, to call for a second independence referendum. It's important in the sense that this is a historic moment for the Green Party. It's the first time that, that they are in office uh, anywhere in the UK. Um, and in terms of the arrangement itself, which isn't a coalition, which a lot of people uh, have been putting about, it's 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 more of, of a consigned agreement between the two parties. The Greens, for instance, have opt-outs on various different issues, although it's yet to be revealed what those issues uh, may be. Uh, but in terms of the narrative surrounding Scottish independence, it, it now means that there is a pro-independence majority uh, in Scottish Holyrood, in the uh, Scottish Parliament, Holyrood, uh, which is very important, which means that not only will they be able to put their agenda forward, but they've now got a concealed effort uh, to try and lobby Boris Johnson and perhaps put forward legislation uh, telling Westminster that Scotland deserves a second independence referendum. And, and that's the point there, isn't it, Lettuce, that it just tightens uh, the uh, the noose a little, perhaps, or the, you know, it just tightens that, that, uh, that pressure a little, doesn't it, for uh, yeah, Westminster no. to say, yes, you can have a second independence referendum. No, completely. The pressure is definitely on at the moment. Um, and I, I really hope that the government will, you know, remain strong against this. Um, one of the main sort of reasons that I believe a second referendum is so sort of outrageous is that it would be just a political downfall. You know, there was the referendum, 
the Scottish people made their free and democratic choice. Um, and now the SNP won a second referendum. The fact that that phrase, second referendum, is even, you know, a, a but phrase let, but that's let's accepted. Stay, but but let's be... stay, their argument is compelling, though, isn't it? Given the fact that the, the, the political landscape has changed so dramatically, that the Brexit vote happened in between then and now, and actually the, the United Kingdom that Scotland voted to remain in uh, uh, back in 2014 doesn't actually exist anymore. Or it's certainly not. It's certainly a very different United Kingdom. And so Nicola Sturgeon would say, well, let us, we deserve to vote on that United Kingdom as opposed to the one that we did. Well, I feel that even though the politics Brexit may have changed slightly, I think that um, an independent Scotland isn't actually in their best economic interests. You know, there are so many aspects of English and Scottish life that are intertwined, such as, you know, the NHS, the huge investment they would have to do into their own NHS, their own sort of armed forces, civil services. These sort of huge economic things I just don't feel are being considered to such a level as the sort of stuck record that is the SNP policy of independence. So if you if you say, if you make that point, then uh, let's say you feel so com so, so con uh, you know compelled to make that argument. What's the risk then in you in 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 Westminster? Say you are Boris Johnson, let us allowing uh, mm. uh, the Scotland to have a second referendum and fighting it. I mean, there might be a majority in theory uh, for uh, a, a second uh, referendum in Parliament uh, with this power sharing agreement between the SNP and the Greens, that isn't to say that there is necessarily a, ma a majority consensus for it if you put it to a vote. You, you would have to regard that as being winnable for both sides, yours as well. Yeah, no, it would definitely, you know, the vote would be a, a, a struggle sort of thing. But the precedent for having a vote, I feel, would completely destroy the relationship between government and sort of people. Although they're saying that the political landscape has changed, what about all those people who in the first referendum voted to remain and now, you know, they're having to go out again and vote again? What does that say for sort of democracy and politics? Well, maybe maybe they would say we we, we, we uh, stuck to remain. We voted to remain in a United Kingdom that was part of Europe. We wanted to be in a country that was in Europe. Now we're not. And so we're going to vote again. And those people might be compelled to, to, uh, to cut adrift. That that may be the case, and you know that would only be we'd have to wait and see for that. But I I don't believe that it would be sort of in the best interest of Scotland to be set adrift. Okay, um, Bill, politically for the Green Party, this is a real big moment, actually, isn't it? Well, you know, when all things considered, when you step back and you take a look at the life of the Green Party and its existence and what it's done and where it's been politically, it is now part of government it is now effectively governing it's a power sharing agreement as you say bill and not necessarily a coalition but for all intents and purposes they are in government um is that is that a, a, a but it is a huge opportunity sh uh, for sure but it also kind of presents a bit of a risk doesn't it because as we well know opposition parties have the opportunity to cart from the sidelines but never get held to account for things now they're going to be held to account to account for stuff i totally agree and i think one thing we need to remember that this power share agreement, which is similar to the structure that they have in New Zealand with their Labour Party and their Green Party, um, isn't just about uh, independence. There's also a policy aspect as well. It's it's an interesting symbiotic relationship, actually, because with the Green Party, they're essentially going into, into office with, with the SNP to exert influence in the run up uh, to COP26, which is going to be happening in Glasgow. Uh, and that can include uh, issues like, for instance, this potential new uh, oil rig, which uh, which might be introduced, uh, and it's caused such uh, controversy uh, among among different MSPs. But then also with the SNP, it's easier for them to pass legislation and budgets, which benefits the Green Party, and it is monumental for them, given the progress that they've made from Caroline Lucas being a member of Parliament to the success that they had at the recent local elections uh, as well. And there's a lot of change happening in the Greens since they're also going to be having a, two new co-leaders nationally um, as well. But Conor Noon actually made a very good point of this the, from the Scotsman. And he said that he believes that actually the Green Party have shot themselves in the foot a little bit because it means come the next Holyrood election um, that the SNP will be able to exploit that specific electorate because the Greens and the SNP hold actually so many similarities, not just on economic policy, but also on social issues as well, particularly when it comes 
uh, to to climate change uh, and also LGBT rights as well. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see what happens and uh, the effects that it had on the Liberal Democrats, for instance, when they were in coalition with the Conservatives, where you saw all those ex passionate Lib Dem voters be taken by David Cameron in 2015. So I don't know whether we'll have to see a similar um, painting being uh, pictured uh, in, in Scotland as For well. Sure. You don't have to see, you have to look very far into history to see what happens to uh, the junior partner in a power sharing agreement or a, a coalition government of sorts. So um, a fair point well made. Bill, uh, hang on there. Lettuce, stick around as well. Our Friday panel is with us on Talk Radio tonight. And- Friday panel is on. Political commentator Lettice Bromowski joins us. Journalist Bill uh, Berkett as well. Uh, hello to Frieda. Uh, he says, never mind Dominic Raab. Uh, he's there to take the pressure off Johnson. It's he who has the questions to answer, but he's protected by smoke screens. It's time to get rid of this clown. It, it is, I mean, I know it's, uh, you know, it's, it's sharp and it's uh, perhaps a predictable thing to say. But it's shared by quite a few. You do get that picture, right? That picture starts to build as Boris Johnson... Uh, continues to fail to act on ministers who do bad things that you wonder if actually it's quite a, a handy protective ring uh, to throw around himself which um they like talking about protective rings don't they um the tories um let's talk about jd sports and customer service this is a really interesting story i don't know if you saw this uh, bill lettuce but jd sports has apparently been described as uh, or voted uh, by witch.com as uh, the worst company in the united kingdom for customer service and I wonder if lettuce. I wonder if, if this is is an interesting um, uh, issue that perhaps we haven't tackled really before. That in this country we have a bit of a problem with customer service. You go on the continent to Spain or to France, perhaps, or to to, to Germany or Italy, uh, or even to Australia, New Zealand, certainly America. We know what America's like for customer service, and it is gold standard, right? Here you get your coffee thrown at you. Uh, the, the customer is always right, seems to have been thrown out the window a long, long time ago. Do we have a, a customer service crisis in this country? Well, I'm not sure if it's uh, exactly a customer service crisis. I can't really speak for customer services in, in Europe or America. Um, but I definitely feel that these sort of issues have been accentuated by um, the COVID pandemic. You know, previously, maybe these customer services, particularly for JD Sports, would have been all in one building together. Um, but as you know, lockdowns came and shops closed, they had to go to their own homes where potentially there were varying, you know, Wi-Fi's getting onto their own service or uh, different distractions at home, amount of devices you can log on to. These would have all played a sort of big part in it being ultimately the worst customer service in Europe or in England. Um, so yeah, I think it's been a huge sort of adjustment because of the pandemic. Um, but I'm not sure if it's a crisis or if it will prevail past this. <laughs> we just listen. We're in the we're in the business of adding crisis on the end of any topic that we have uh, lettuce, just to <laughs> just to whip things up a little bit. So, so maybe you're right about crisis. Bill, do we have do we have let's let's say a subtle problem uh, with customer service in this country? Do you think? I mean, you, your experience of going to somewhere like America or Europe is very very different, isn't it? Not just when you call at a call center, but when you go to a cafe or you take something back to a shop or you're browsing. A around a retail store i was in america recently and i was shocked to see how good their customer service actually was the hospitality that you you get from people um and and also how alert and and seems like they care when when they listen when you they they seem to listen when when you seem to have an obvious or prevailing issue but i i do suppose that we do have a problem in, in this country the u.s does outperform us and and I suppose part of it is is down not only to this uh, this switch between kind of like a, a transactional to a relationship economy uh, with the amount that we're purchasing online, for instance, uh, rather than than and than in shops or on the high street, uh, but also, as Lester's rightly points out, the pandemic has brought a totally new sphere when it comes to the different issues that customer service have to face. You know, lockdowns bringing huge pressure on retailers, uh, delivery companies, suppliers, uh, and so on. And it's supposed we weren't always able to get that level of, you know, satisfaction and response because of the mounting pressure that is that is put on them. But these, this issue was prevalent before even the pandemic. In fact, this year probably is the worst customer service that Britain has had for a decade. 
as well. And maybe we need to start looking at the way in which we engage with consumers uh, in, in when it comes specifically to customer satisfaction. Okay, or lettuce. Have we been getting it wrong on the on the other foot, on the other shoe? Because I can feel people who work in retail or work in hospitality screaming at the radio or the television tonight, lettuce, saying, screw you. We put up with all sorts of absolute nonsense. We put up with you demanding things that you don't deserve. This nonsense about the customer being always right brings out the worst in you, and I've got to bend over backwards to please you when you're actually just being ridiculous. Have we kind of got it wrong a little bit, actually, that, that, that we shouldn't be pandering to people being difficult and, and the person who's serving can be whatever flavour of difficult they feel? I mean, yeah, there's definitely a point in there, but I feel like... There is a certain sort of expectation when you go into the hospitality industry, you know, that you have to have this level of uh, hospitableness, really. <laughs> you've got to, you know, you've got to be hospitable to the customer. And you are always going to get someone who, throughout the day who is just being annoying, sort of a nuisance, pandering to the, you know, pathetic. But it's sort of part of the job description that you just sometimes have to put up with those unruly customers. Um, should it be, and, you know, why put should a it be? Why should, why, should, why should there be any job where you put up with people being difficult to you? I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I've worked in the hospitality industry myself, really. But it's just sort of if you put that smile on the face, you sell a few more shoes. Or if you <laughs> laugh at a customer's bad jokes, you might get a tip at the end of your shift, you know. Those sort of things uh, bring in a bit more money for yourself. It'll probably just make your own job easier. The last thing we need lettuce is to be encouraging bad jokes. Come on, this is not, this is not where <laughs> we need to be. Have you, got, have you got some experiences? I mean, you've worked in, in hospitality. Uh, you must have mm. faced some difficult customers. Have you got some experience? That you I, share? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, one of the worst, uh, you know, customer service experience I had, I was working at um, Henley Regatta one year as a waitress. Um, and I definitely found that the worst, you know, the later the night got, the drunker people got, <laughs> the worse they became to staff. And just little things like just little being rude about collecting cups or throwing things on the floor. Like, yeah, terrible service, really. Mm. I mean, Bill, do we also have a problem with the fact that we don't regard customer service jobs, hospitality jobs and retail jobs? in the way that perhaps they should be regarded, especially given what we've learned in the pandemic, right? I mean, we've talked a lot about shopkeepers in the last 18 months or shop assistants or people working at Tesco's or whatever else. In America or in uh, certainly in particularly, particularly in places like Spain, Greece, you go to Greece and, and uh, uh, you know, a, a waiter is a, a top high class job, or at least it, it has been in the last uh, couple of decades uh, culturally. Do we have a problem with the way that we perceive these jobs and also pay these jobs as well? Perhaps so, but it's weird to see that when you look at who, who works in, in hospitality uh, or, or within the customer facing role description, that's two thirds of the UK workforce. Mm. Uh, and also it's been research has heavily proven that companies performing above average in terms of customer satisfaction always outperform their below average competitors. And part of it, like I said, is the pandemic. But another of it is, is this technological shift uh, away from the high street and to, to online as well. And we, we like to talk about the worst performing in terms of satisfaction, JD Sports. But we can look at a, a company like First Direct and see, well, they're one of the best. How can we maybe as a country or businesses across, across the land do better? Mm. And the reason they say their chief executive is to treat customers as individuals rather than rather than just another number and mm. that is in her experience in hospitality in myself and working in hospitality uh, as well that is absolutely the case go on, go on bill if give you, us if go you, on bill give us if you're give us, efficient give us a story go on give us an example of a really bad uh, uh, piece of uh, uh, time you've had in hospitality go on what's your worst oh uh, well i i used to work i kind of part worked as as a kitchen porter and and then also helped back back when it came to setting up uh and there was this one time there's this customer just bombed into the door and just started shouting his absolute mouth off and and it and it was it was you know an intimidating moment but you know as an as a, someone working there you have to remain calm and able and, and try and work out something 
in that just very moment to lead them going out the door uh, with a smile rather than a grump on grumpy face uh, so yeah. i suppose when it comes to to that as well you know i do sympathize with a lot of people working customer service or within those industries it's long hours it's lots of complaints and it's stressful and actually the only way in which companies are able to shift away uh, from this negative reception and move towards a model where like first direct where customers are overwhelmingly satisfied rather than dissatisfied it only comes from the top so there need, really needs to be a conceived mm. effort to maybe look at the united states or look at companies that do well and think well how can we do better yeah that's true it's really fascinating though that we've empowered people to feel like it's acceptable to storm into a kitchen and start shouting at the staff at a restaurant if you're not very happy right what a weird weird place we've got ourselves into there uh, bill lettuce thank you and also bill uh, thank you for for bringing some stats some hospitality stats to the table unexpectedly uh, i like that uh, lettuce really nice to talk to you as well thank you so much for your time uh both of you tonight uh, uh journalist bill baggett and political commentator lettuce uh, bromovsky as well with us on talk radio tonight